Hi, and welcome to Meet a Google Researcher, a series where we get to meet some folks who are advancing the state of the art in helpful technology, tackling some incredibly difficult problems. I'm Drew Calcagno, and I'll be your host. Today, we're going to dive into research on wildfires. Artificial intelligence offers unique capabilities to better understand the Earth's physical processes like never before. We're looking at ways AI can better interpret, predict, and enhance our reactions to natural disasters. In that vein, today we're going to learn more from Noam Loya and Omer Nevo, two research scientists at Google Research on our Carmel team. And they're working on enhancing responses to wildfires with creative uses of AI. In recent years, the number of wildfires has been increasing, and they're burning more land, endangering more people's lives, safety, and health in profound ways. These researchers, though, they've flipped the problem on its head and found novel ways to help fire authorities act quickly when time is of the essence. So welcome, Noam and Omar. I'm so happy that you're here. Pleasure to be here. And so, Noam, why don't you um, kick us off? Tell us more about you. Um, so, hi, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Noam. Uh, I live in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, I've been in Google for a couple of years now. And uh, I'm a member of the Wildfire team in Carmel, which Omer leads. Yeah, I'm Omer. I've been in Google for a year and a half, and I've been leading the team for that time. Omer, how do you decide what work you're going to work on, and what's inspired you to get there? As a part of the larger Carmel group, one of the things that I find genuinely inspiring is how we look at the different problems and ask, where can we do the most good? And we usually look at three different things. One, is this a big global problem that genuinely affects lots of people in meaningful ways? Two, do we believe we have the tools and the ability to make a big dent in that problem? Can we actually make a difference? And three, do we bring something unique to that problem, either because not enough people are working on that problem and it's neglected enough, or because being Google, we have machine learning expertise or the ability to reach so many people, which is unique and allows us to do something that's special. And that means that we're looking at things like flood forecasting, like traffic light optimization to reduce CO2 emissions, like mapping buildings in Africa and the world, and like, of course, wildfires. And I feel like what you're working on is incredibly special. And it sounds like there's hardware involved, software involved, a lot of different computing resources, and of course, both of your minds and the minds of your team. So what's inspired you, Noam, and, and how do you pick the work that you're working on? Um, so I actually got uh, to the wildfire team, I, I guess, uh, accidentally. Really? Um, I was interested in machine learning. I knew that I wanted to do uh, research, and I looked for a research team uh, in a uh, in, in research generally, and uh, uh, the option to join uh, the wildfire team uh, has popped, and uh, I, I, I felt it was a great opportunity to do uh, meaningful research and meaningful impact, which uh, I find very exciting, so uh, that was uh, great. Um, and generally on our team, we focus on uh, three main things. So the first thing is boundary detection, where when there's a current fire, we want to uh, detect its boundaries uh, using satellite imagery. Wow. And uh, give this uh, information to the public using uh, uh, maps, using search, using uh, Android identification. This is actually launched in North America and uh, Australia. Wow, so, that's so yeah, exciting. That's exciting. The second thing is uh, ignition detection, which is my main focus, where we want to detect uh, when a fire is starting and let uh, fire authorities know uh, as soon as possible so they'll know uh, to put it out. And is that um, faster than it has been in the past because of what you worked on? It seems like it. For, yeah, for, for, some wild, for some wildfires, we can detect them yeah. faster than Great. other sources. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and the third thing is propagation prediction, where uh, we want to predict where a current fire is going to go, where is it going to spread to. And when you think about social impact work. Does that change your research approach or how you're thinking about these types of problems? Yes, yes it is. Um, I mean, many things are similar. We do uh, uh, do define our metrics and do uh, feature engineering and uh, train a model, et cetera. Uh, but I think the main difference is how we view errors. When you talk about wildfires, being 90% correct uh, all the time is, is, not, is not enough because uh, when you make a mistake, you can cr cause serious damage to actual people, which can be terrible. Um, so we have to be really meticulous about uh, our work and go over each example we have, see if we made an error, what caused this error, what can we do to uh, avoid this, uh, so we know that we did uh, the best we can to, uh, to uh, give the, the best information uh, to the public and to authorities. 
I can only imagine how impactful that is for for folks, whether they're the people that are fighting actual fires or uh, folks that are in its path. I, I can only imagine the the type of impact that's going to have even down the line when these models and simulations and predictions get even better. Mm -hmm. And Omar, when you think about all of these things, what about social impact affects your methodology and research? I think the main thing relates to what Norm was talking about, about having to be very meticulous about every single, like we looked literally at every single wildfire we had data for to see how that works. And a good example of what that looks like, right, is once we had a basic boundary detection model working and we were looking at, looking through the errors, we saw a relatively rare error, maybe several nights a year, in the middle of the night, 20 to 30 minutes, our model was doing this weird thing where it was thinking all of Australia is on fire, which <laughs> thankfully, oh, thankfully it was not, right? <laughs> um, and we were wondering what's, what's going on there. And so if for these 30 minutes the model thinks everything is on fire, what are the inputs like? And so we look at the satellite data that's coming in and we see the satellite gives us multispectral imaging. And so we see visible light, so the red, green, and blue in general. And we see that the satellite sees in the middle of the night as if suddenly there's a light everywhere. And so we call this the alien intervention phenomenon, right? (laughs) Were there aliens actually coming? So (laughs) we'll we'll see, we'll see in a second, right? and so we, we tried to figure out, right, what does this alien intervention look like? When do the aliens like to, to come <laughs> here? And tried to figure this out. And what we saw was there were weird uh, symmetries about when it's coming. And so we had one alien intervention 66 days before the shortest day of the year in Australia. And then okay. another one 66 days after the shortest day. Ah. And so on one hand, that sounds really, really weird. But if you've seen these sort of things before, you might get the intuition where it might be some astronomical angles okay. situation. And so... If we can see, I think it'll show up on the screen now, an image of what the Earth looks like from the satellite on a night, which is unsurprisingly the Earth and it's dark and Australia is near the bottom. Um, and then we took an image just like that from a night where this happened. And what you can see is you can see exactly how the sun is just peeking right below the Earth, oh, wow. causing a glare in the camera, and all of Australia is obscured by that glare. And so the model sees there's light everywhere and thinks that's fire. And it's very easy to fix that once we know what the problem is, but finding that out is a really cool sort of detective work that we have to do in order to figure every single single one of the errors and figure out where it's coming from and take that out. I am so glad it, one, wasn't a wildfire, but also <laughs> that it wasn't an alien invasion. So that's that's very encouraging that you're able to correct for that type of error. With those fire authorities, Omar, you've worked with these folks, you both have, for a long time, right? What does it look like to work with them? Are you helping them in like real time and they're turning to you for assistance? It's a huge part of our work. I think the first thing we did was go to communities that are affected by fires and go to fire authorities and ask them, (laughs) what are they doing now? Understand their processes. What's missing? What are the things that we could bring that would be meaningful? And what's interesting about this is because this is a global problem, that means parts of it look very, very different from one another. And so talking to authorities in Australia, which have a multitude of data sources and figuring out what in our data is unique and different and can help them is so different from talking to authorities in Kenya who are talking about the barriers of while they're fighting a fire not having internet connectivity and how can we make sure that the data that we bring is still available during that time. And how are you thinking about this entire problem? Like what are you providing to these fire authorities? I think what we want to do is figure out where are the areas that they have uncertainty (laughs) and in those areas figure out can we make a meaningful difference in the information that they have in front of them when they make decisions? And that might be where there are fires, where should we send our resources? And that might be for an ongoing fire, where is it going to go? Where do we put our people? Even just making sure that the firefighters themselves are safe, knowing where the fire is likely to go next. How long has this type of collaboration been in the works? I feel like this would have taken a long time, especially with you know a, a public and private partnership. Is this kind of ongoing all the time? Were yeah, you... it's ongoing all the time. We're on a schedule where we talk to them relatively regularly. Again, different fire authorities in different amounts, but we talk to them regularly throughout our work. And a lot of it is getting ongoing feedback with what we're building, seeing we've made this step, does this look right? And then figure out and, and re- retry from there if that's not exactly what they're looking for. And are you able to distill all of these models uh, that you're working on and have something really concrete that you describe? and, and I imagine there's a lot of fog of uncertainty. So what do you do for them? Yeah, okay. So uh, actually talking to fire authorities helped us uh, to uh, get a more concise model uh, in the propagation uh, prediction problem, Mm -hmm. which is when uh, we have a fire and we want to uh, predict where is it going uh, uh, to go next, uh, where is it going to move forward. Um, So... uh, 
the natural thing to do is to look at it as a, a sequence of images um, where each pixel can be burning or not burning, and uh, we, we want to predict which pixel will be burning mm -hmm. next. So we did this, and we got the uh, state-of-the-art, basically, results, and it wasn't good enough for fire authorities because really? it didn't give them uh, anything they could work with. It wasn't, it wasn't good enough uh, because fires are really chaotic as well. So this made us think, think that we have to look at this uh, problem a little differently. And uh, what we realized is that we can look at uh, the area surrounding a current fire and split it into uh, pieces, like pizza slices. We actually call this the pizza model. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> um, so, uh, and instead of saying which pixel will be burning next, we can say to which slice are we going uh, to go. And, and so bringing kind of the little levity to a grave problem of the pizza model, you're, the fire is at the center. Mm -hmm. And you're essentially saying which slice, which sector is most vulnerable next? Yeah, definitely. D do you have or encourage fire authorities to push resources to that next you know, slice or avoid a certain slice? I think in the first step, we want to provide them the, with the information and let them decide mm -hmm. what they want to do with it. And we will do our best to give them the best information they can get. That's incredible. I, I love the imagery of being able to really direct resources, time, people um, into the proper direction instead of just thinking about a very mercurial fire working around. And so what else have, have you been inspired by going forward when you're thinking about next steps for your work? I think one of the things that we're looking at is, again, looking forward when we have what we have right now. So when we say we have ignition detection and we have propagation, and when we feel that's good enough, looking at further ways in which wildfires affect people, looking at air pollution and looking at even being able to do planned burns in order to stop fires before they happen. But again, those things are, are far in the future. We're, no, we're nowhere near there at that point. Well, I'm tremendously excited about them. I, I really believe that a lot of this technology has the power to, to be helping not only authorities, people, but keep people safe. So thank you so much for coming here and telling me about it. Thank you for, thank you for having, having us. us. Today we heard from Noam and Omer, two research scientists who help make creative AI models that are helpful to fighting wildfires. Stay tuned for more episodes on helpful technology from Google Research coming soon. Mm -hmm.